Okay, well, I think it's about time to start. Uh, good evening to everyone. Amanda, it's not evening on your side, but uh, welcome nonetheless. Uh, we're very pleased to have our, our speaker today, uh, Professor Amanda Miller. Uh, Amanda is a professor of economics at the University of Virginia. Her, her PhD is from Stanford. Her prior degree is from MIT, very impressive uh, set of educational credentials. Uh, Amanda does labor, health, law and economics, and uh, also, last but not least, women's studies. And this is what is her topic today, which is effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on domestic violence in LA. Amanda, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I think this is one of those, um, I guess, COVID uh, silver linings that it's easier for me to actually give a presentation um, in Russia, which I've never had the opportunity to do before and which, um, uh, you know, travel is, um, you know, a little bit a little bit harder to do when you have to actually physically get on a plane. So it's um, really nice to be here to be able to share um, this research. Um, I think I do need permission to share my screen. I don't know who the official host is. Um, but I have well, slides. That, uh, I, I, I could go without them, but um, oh no, 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 of course. Well, well uh, some uh, nice, nice uh, pictures that you might want. One of the Center for Institutional Studies account uh, is the official host. Uh, oh, are they able to? Uh, sorry, I try to decide this question. Please wait a minute. Okay, well, I can share mine as far as you can see it. Please There's try no now. Okay. okay. Oh, now I got it. Okay, great. Perfect. Excellent. Uh, here we go. Business. Sorry. Thanks. Okay, so now I just have to read. We have it. This Thanks so much. You can see. Great. And then I'm going to try not to look all the way over to the side to see you guys. So I'm going to just put you in gallery so I can see. Um, if anybody is waving. Um, so, um, so I was told 45 minutes, I have more than 45 minutes, but um, you know, I'll kind of stop at a natural point. Also uh, feel free to interrupt uh, with clarifying questions or even um, other comments are fine. Um, I know this is sort of um, an area, uh, you know, this is a paper about, about the current um, pandemic um, and I know uh, uh, people have uh, maybe related research. And so if you wanted to use uh, some opportunity to tell me about um, stuff you're doing um, on domestic violence or other topics, I'm also happy uh, to sort of hear and, and sort of learn as a two-way thing. I have stuff to share, but you know, everything I want to tell you is in the paper. Um, so you can, um, uh, I'm happy to kind of share the time in both directions. Uh, so this is uh, joint work with uh, a longtime co-author of mine, Carmeet Siegel, who is um, at the University of Zurich. And um, part of our inspiration is um, a paper that Carmeet and I um, worked on that got for a while and that uh, was published um, in 2019, um, looking at um, domestic violence um, and looking at the effects of female police officers um, on rates of domestic violence. And kind of one of the, the big insights for us in that paper was the relationship between um, uh, or the sort of the difficulty and the challenge of measuring domestic violence, um, especially when you use um, traditional sources of crimes reported to police. And so um, that was kind of a central concern in thinking about assessing the impact of female officers, where you think, oh, female officers might be really good, but part of that could be that they get more women to report crimes, and so they would look bad um, if you just looked at reported crime. And so um, kind of that thinking was part of our motivation here in sort of addressing, you know, how do we think about what's happening with this pandemic on domestic violence um, when it's so hard to measure um, what's actually going on. And so that's, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the other co-author is Melissa Spencer, who is a student of mine, um, uh, a graduate student who is uh, just uh, actually just passed her uh, dissertation defense on Monday. So she's uh, Dr. Spencer now, and she'll be uh, starting as an assistant professor um, at the University of Richmond in the fall. So. Um, it was really great to have her involved in this project. Um, we um, got a little bit of funding uh, to pay Melissa and some undergraduates to help us uh, with data work. Um, but of course, we're responsible for you know all the errors and thoughts. Okay, so uh, background um, motivation is you know the 
pandemic hits and a lot of attention and concern from policymakers and the press um, that, you know, even if you're not a researcher in domestic violence, you would notice was this concern that, that, that it could lead to more domestic violence. And some of the really, you know, early reports on the impact of the pandemic in Wuhan were even talking about um, concerns about escalation um, and, and DV. And in particular, there's sort of two concerns. One is sort of this um, concern that the incidents might go up, that more things might be happening and it might be getting more severe, especially um, if, uh, if women are trapped um, with their abusers. Um, and that could be because of the pandemic itself, it could be because of stress, it could be because of job loss and unemployment or economic uncertainty. Um, and it could also be because of the policy responses. So a lot of concern was that shutdowns themselves or stay at home orders or things telling people stay, you know, don't go out um, could, could trap victims. And so they feel like, you know, they wanna leave and they can't because there's nowhere to go. Um, or it could reduce their access to services and then that would lead to more incidents. Um, at the same time, in addition to this concern about incidents, there's concern about reporting um, where it may be harder to report or women who are suffering may be less likely to report and then then itself that could sort of be um, in, in a bad cycle lead to, to greater incidents if now the perpetrators know that they won't be punished or caught um, and so um, so this is sort of a big concern um, internationally a lot of you know different individual countries um, were concerned about this um, international organizations in the US there was um, a you know, non-trivial amount of funding, um, about uh, a little less than $50 million were allocated specifically for increasing services for domestic violence victims um, as part of the CARES Act, which was um, the big federal law that was passed in the US um, with uh, coronavirus relief. Um, and so because of this, you know, there's a lot of concern. It makes a lot of sense. Policymakers are worried about it. At the same time, at least theoretically, it's not 100% clear that domestic violence has to increase. It is possible that, some incidents might go up, but it's also possible that some incidents um, could be averted. In particular, if some couples um, that had violence in the relationship were not cohabiting, um, or a lot of violence um, happens um, when um, among exes. And so if they are not interacting as much because of the um, because of the pandemic, that could less lead, that could reduce some incidents. It's also possible that the cost to the offender uh, might have gone up. And so the costs of sort of being arrested and spending a night in jail, um, if you're afraid about of getting infected and catching COVID, you know, that could be a, a deterrent. Um, it's also possible that, you know, we think reporting might go down, reporting might have gone up, particularly if the policy response was effective, so that there was enough kind of additional resources and advertising and public health statements um, that we got more people to report things. And so maybe people who um, wouldn't have reported in the past would have reported. Um, and so, you know, measuring the impact is important, um, but also um, difficult. So we want to kind of, with, with our paper, we sort of started with this broad motivation if we want to understand what was the impact of the pandemic and also thinking maybe this will um, give us some insight into the underlying factors that are determinants of, of what causes um, domestic violence. Uh, the measurement challenge I kind of opened with on the first slide, but basically we have this problem where um, there's, you know, this thing, there's the incidents that happens to the population, and then there's what gets reported. And reporting itself is endogenous, and so it's hard to interpret what's happening about incidents if we just look at uh, what's reported. And so a lot of studies um, either assume that reporting doesn't change. That's not a good assumption here with the pandemic where we think reporting could change. Um, the other thing that's typically done is to try to rely on some measure that's not sensitive to reporting. Um, so a, dis a, a survey, a victimization study that just kind of takes the whole population and asks, have you been um, a victim? Um, that at least doesn't suffer from the reporting to the police. And that's what uh, Carmeet and I used um, in, our, in our first paper. Um, another thing people do is use medical data, so hospitalizations, um, you know, either things that are coded as being related to DV or even just um, injuries that are kind of suggestive, um, or looking at fatal outcomes where reporting um, happens. All of these have, you know, um, their benefits, their limitations, but for the most part, they're not available um, until, at least in the US, it takes a couple of years before you get these data processed and, and, and available to research. And so if you're trying to figure out what's going on in real time with the pandemic, you know, you don't have access to these better sources. And so what people have done is basically relied on a combination of anecdotes um, or, you know, something a little more rigorous, which is kind of taking advantage of the data, uh, mainly in the US, uh, real time open access police records. Um, and these are available in kind of a haphazard way. Some cities have them, some of them don't. They're sort of different history 
histories of what they, who gives what, it's very ad hoc. Um, there's no common definitions or data elements or even sort of list of what's included um, or, um, uh, and so, or, or coverage. And so what ends up happening is we have this kind of view that's limited because it's reported to police and then further limited by what the police share with us. So what we wanna do in this paper is kind of approach two questions. One is the specific question of what can, what do we think happened? What was the effect of uh, COVID-19 and particularly these initial shutdowns and initial reopening on domestic violence in the US? Um, and then the second thing is kind of this meta question about what is it, what are the sort of limitations and value of you trying to use this real time police data? We know they're flawed. You know, are they at least telling us a consistent story? Can we at least draw a qualitative conclusion from them? Um, and spoiler alert, if you haven't read the paper, the answer is going to be no. It's kind of a mess. And um, that's what I'll uh, share with you. So it's not kind of your typical nice clean paper where we have a story and mechanism and everything is clean and we show you robustness that it's going to be the same no matter what. It's, it's quite the opposite. Um, and so uh, what we're going to do in this paper, this is part of a broader agenda where we're trying to look at other cities, but uh, the kind of issues I mentioned on the previous slide about data quality and lack of comparability has made it um, a little bit challenging for us. So we're still collecting more cities and sort of seems like almost every city is its, its own thing in terms of what they measure and what they give us. Um, but um, so what I want to do in this study is basically focus on one city where we spent the most time and I think we have the best understanding. Um, and if there's, you know, in the Q&A, maybe I could tell you a little bit about um, what we're seeing in other cities as well. Um, so we're focusing on Los Angeles. Um, LA is, um, we picked it for two reasons. One, it's a city that gives really um, very good, rich police data um, that covers calls, crimes, and arrests, and gives a detailed breakdown by severity. And also, unlike a lot of other cities, um, a crime incident can include up to four specific criminal uh, criminal uh, crimes within that incident. Um, some cities only code the most severe. So you could have some incidents that have DV in them, but DV isn't coded because it wasn't the most severe crime. Um, also, the other major advantage for us of, of LA is that we were able to obtain um, um, through a partnership uh, with the county access to a non-police measure of domestic violence. And that's uh, from the hotline. Um, so this is a victim hotline. It's not related to the police um, and it's it's sort of different services, but uh, related uh, you know, to, to underlying incidents. Also, of course, LA is a large city. It's an important city. The police force has, you know, 1300 um, employees um, and the population served by the LAPD is about 4 million. The county overall is about 10 million. Um, this is also within the US, a city that had early exposure to the pandemic that was hit pretty hard by the pandemic and the lockdown that was actually implemented in LA was uh, probably the most severe in the US among major US cities. Um, so a lot of cities had kind of shutdowns that were not as serious as what was experienced experienced in Europe or, you know, in other countries. Um, so the data we have, uh, we look at sort of, uh, we have data on uh, dispatches. This is basically calls to the police, 911 calls or other radios. Um, we have crime incidents. Uh, these are offense reports. We could see, like I said, up to four crimes and we can also see the outcome for every crime. And then we have these calls to the DV hotline. Um, this is just sort of, uh, I think you can see my little mouse. This is the, the means um, in the pre-pandemic period. So 2018 and 2019, um, you can see uh, calls are the most common, um, less than a third, of, about a third of calls leads to a crime or it, the, the ratio is about three to one. It's actually not a direct mapping. Um, we don't know this from LA, but we know this from other cities. Things that get coded as DV crimes didn't necessarily come from DV calls. They may have come from other calls that were not DV. After the police show up, they realize there's DV. DV calls can lead to no crime or they could sometimes lead to a non-DV crime. So that mapping is not um, direct either, but the ratio at least is about a third. Um, and then the arrests are even smaller. So. Um, you know, about a, a, a third to a quarter, uh, a quarter to a third of uh, crimes are leading to arrests. And then the hotline calls are, are less, um, even less common. Um, so what we do is we're going to look at this major city. We um, are unusual in having police and non-police within a U.S. city. Um, we'll show you these heterogeneous effects across measures and data sources. Um, and we're going to also uh, look a little bit about what happens with reopening. And I'll talk a little bit about mechanisms. Um, um, over there, and um, and I'll kind of um, 
show you the, the results. Um, so what we find is we do find um, effects. Uh, we find that the effects are there even after we kind of control for some mechanism, um, but that they are conflicting. They are sort of opposites opposite uh, direction across the different measures. Um, and so we think that this maybe helps explain some of this conflict that's existing in these initial um, COVID studies uh, that have found different effects. So some studies have found increases, um, but others in other locations or even the same locations, but using different data have found decreases. Um, the fact, you know, you might kind of compare across these studies and say, is it just that different cities had different reactions? Um, um, although it's sort of, you know, that does, then we'd ask what's the underlying mechanism of why are they different? Um, but I think we sort of see the puzzle is even worse than that within a particular city, we find um, conflicting evidence. And so I think that that sort of, I think um, highlights this, this challenge or difficulty of measurement, especially in trying to use um, real time data to, to attack this question. Um, and it does suggest, you know, caution about drawing broad conclusions from either one. Um, either single type of data, either the police or the hotlines or the crimes versus the calls. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna show you um, in terms of, I'm gonna kind of jump into a little bit of analysis and then the results, and it's it's all pretty simple. Um, it's sort of a kind of difference in difference type of approach. I'll show you some pictures um, where we kind of um, do daily, um, daily crime levels over time, and I'll show you a line for 2020, and we'll just compare it to the previous two years, 2019 and 2018. Um, and then I'll show you kind of the same variation, but um, instead of using the day by day, kind of aggregating into these three time periods of before the pandemic, during the initial shutdown, and then after the initial shutdown. Um, and we'll be comparing um, the sort of overall effects of the shutdown on, um, on, the, on the different out, uh, DV outcomes of interest. Um, the regression model is pretty simple. We're just gonna control for differences um, by year and by month and day of the week. We could put in other controls um, um, it's not going to really make much difference in, in what we do here. Um, and I'll show you, um, we'll throw in some covariates to try to explore the mechanism. Um, and I'll kind of show you what we show, what we find. So basically the time period uh, in this uh, paper goes from 2020, January, it goes from January till August, January 1st to August 24th for each of the three years. So it's the same time of the year in each year, in each of the three years. Um, and this is the only in 2020, of course, do we have a COVID-19 shutdown and then this post shutdown period. So the beta one in the regression is gonna be the effect of the shutdown relative to the pre shutdown period in 2020, comparing that change to the change in that same time period in 2018 and 2019. Um, and then the beta two is gonna be the incremental effect of reopening compared to being shut down. Um, and then we'll also um, for convenience kind of show you what's the effect of if you add these two, which would be the, the reopening compared to pre shutdown um, to see, you know, did reopening totally reverse to where we were before? You'll see the answer in general is no. Um, the regression model has the fixed effects. Um, and then I'll tell you more about the covariates when we get there. Um, okay, so this is um, the first outcome we look at. This is, um, I think, a lot of the results that have found increases in DV uh, crimes in the US, at least, have focused on call data rather than crime data. When we look at the calls, so these uh, dispatches in LA, we find, um, we also find an increase during the um, initial shutdown. So the red line is 2020, the x axis is just time, it's just date, um, and the y axis is the number of um, calls per. Um, um, per, per 100,000 population per day. And so what you can see is that kind of before the pandemic, um, you know, the beginning of the year, the lines are not exactly the same. Um, 2020 might be a little bit lower, uh, but not too different. And then once we get into this shutdown period, maybe it's a little bit of a relative increase a little bit before the official shutdown. I'll get back to that in a sec. Um, but then basically you see this relative increase, particularly, um, you know, over here and over here during the shutdown compared to what happened in prior years. So this is sort of an unexpected increase increase in calls um, for domestic violence um, to the LAPD. Um, and then you see after reopening, there's sort of a really big decline and calls are actually lower. Um, and that's basically what we find. Uh, the shutdown is associated with a significant increase in calls, about half a call um, per day per 100,000 population. So it's about a 13% increase in call volume. And then there's this shutdown decline that's even bigger. So that the net effect actually is that during the reopening in the summer in LA, calls for DV were actually lower than would have been predicted um, in that same time period uh, if we compared to the pre-pandemic. Um, for crimes, we actually see a very different picture. 
Um, so what we see is, um, again, similar in the pre-pandemic, uh, pre-shutdown kind of looks similar. And then we see the significant decrease during the shutdown calls. Uh, sorry, crimes um, related to domestic violence go down significantly. And then in the reopening, um, instead of seeing a reversal, we see a continuation. So we see continued decline. And in fact, the decline is even greater. Um, so um, on the one hand, you know, if we're sort of looking at these two outcomes, both from the police, one of them is telling us that in the shutdown, calls went up and DV is getting worse. The other one is showing the opposite, call, crimes are going down. Um, and so it's um, kind of a question of how we reconcile it. When we look at the post shutdown, they're kind of similar in the sense that they're both declining, um, but opposite in terms of what they're doing relative to their prior trend. And the, de the decline in crimes, of course, in the post period is, is highly significant um, um, and significantly lower than what it was before. Um, if we look at arrests, arrests kind of look like crimes, um, but maybe um, smaller and noisier. Um, but if we just look at the crimes, um, the share of crimes that lead to an arrest, you see we basically don't see much change during the shutdown, maybe a decline, slight decline, and then a pretty big decline during the, um, during the post uh, reopening period. Um, and so you can see that here, the arrests are not significantly, so DV arrests um, are not significantly different during the initial shutdown, but they are much lower during the post shutdown. Um, we'll come, I'll, I think that here we have a bit of a mechanism that explains this decline, and I think it's not uh, directly about the pandemic, but uh, maybe more about the, um, um, the, uh, the political protests and, um, that were taking place in the summer. Um, all right, and now here's our kind of unusual data that is not the publicly available data from the police departments, it's from the hotline in the county. Um, and what you see here is really dramatic. So the call volume is usually here um, at around 0.2 or lower. During the initial shutdown, there's just a huge increase in calls. Um, during the reopening, the call volume goes down, but it still ends up, this is about, um, on average, this is about 150% of the usual value, um, usual rate of calls. And here they're still um, at 100% increase. So they're still getting about twice as many calls throughout the summer um, per day than they would typically get. Um, and usually they don't see much seasonal variation. They don't see much variation of, uh, at all. Um, so the hotline has really experienced a huge increase. Um, and that's at the same time, right, that crimes are going down. And even dispatches by this point, calls to police are going down. Hotline calls here, even though they've declined relative to their peak during the shutdown, are still pretty high, still pretty elevated. Um, so overall, we're finding, you know, very different effects compared uh, across these different measures, um, inconsistent in like, deep fundamental ways. Um, and so how can we kind of make sense of them? I think there's kind of um, a few explanations of what could be going on. I think one possibility is um, sort of doesn't, says that people in the population are kind of not, this is are, are, um, um, are experiencing um, more DV. So there's more incidents happening. Um, and that reporting rates are either not changing or not changing very much. So there's more crime and more crime gets to re reported to the police. Um, and so that's why we see this increase in reporting rates. But we're not seeing more crimes because the police show up or they don't show up and they're just reacting less intensively. And so they are hesitant to record um, things as crimes. Now, you might think that that makes sense. Maybe with COVID, police don't wanna interact with someone. If you report as a crime, you might feel like you have to arrest them and then interact with them. Police don't wanna get COVID. Maybe they're worried about offenders. They don't wanna put them in a crowded jail. Um, the only, you know, I think that my hesitation or hesitation with that interpretation is that it seems like you would have seen that with the arrest rates and we don't see it with arrest rates because writing it as a crime, I, it's not clear that that's a burden on the police or increasing their risk. Um, putting it, you know, and about, um, you know, two thirds of the crimes are not leading to arrests anyway. So it didn't, so, so uh, you know, I, we, it doesn't seem like they're responding less intensively on every margin. Um, it's still possible that that's, that, that that's the explanation. Another possibility is that there's differences in uh, reporting. It's possible that reporting went up. Um, so the crime rate is uh, lower and that's why we see fewer crimes, but there's more reporting of incidents that are, you know, some kind of a conflict, some kind of a dispute, um, but not necessarily uh, rising to the level of, of an actual crime. Um, there was more advertising uh, people, and so there could have been victims or third, party, third parties might have been more willing to report. Um, it's also possible that if people were home more, there might have been more witnesses for the same kinds of fighting or, you know, concerning things that uh, witnesses hear. Um, but witnesses who are third party, especially, so not inside the home, um, 
might call the police and not know exactly what's going on. So when we talk to um, LAPD officers who, you know, focus on domestic violence, they said that, you know, um, you know, they were also kind of puzzled. We talked to them about our results and sort of what's going on. And, you know, they did, they thought, you know, that the, that the third party reporting, um, sometimes people, um, you know, they call, they think it's DV, the police, the officers show up and they talk to, you know, talk to the, um, talk to the family and, and at least nobody says that, the, that there's um, DV going on. So, um, so it is possible that, that the witnesses are reporting things that are not crimes. It's also possible that, that that's happening at the same time that, so that there is this increased reporting of the type that is sort of either less serious or not criminal, um, but also a decreased reporting of some of the more serious criminal incidents. And so um, it could be that, you know, the really bad things that are going on, the neighbors are not hearing about and they don't know what's happening. Um, and so they're not calling the police. So there's sort of this increased volume of, of the serious ones, but, um, but the less, um, but, uh, sort of the less serious calls, but, but the more severe ones um, um, are happening and, and we're just, we just don't see that. Um, and so we did try to kind of um, examine this by seeing, you know, is there a pattern in the severity of the calls or the crimes? Like, is it all just less severe calls that are going up or um, um, less severe uh, crimes that are going down? Um, we don't see that. We see increases. So we can split the calls based on how they coded at the time of the call. It seems like they're going up for both. Um, assaults and disputes. Assaults are more serious than disputes. Um, they're both going up um, more so in for disputes, but but also significant for assaults. Um, if we look at by the crime severity, we also find um, we can split assault crimes into assaults versus non-assault crimes. Again, we see that the decline is there for both assaults and for less severe crimes, although bigger for assaults than less severe. Um, and then when we split assaults into simple assault and aggravated assault, so, you know, uh, aggravated would usually mean it involves a weapon um, or a serious injury, um, a simple assault um, would not have those features, um, you know, we see the decline for simple is kind of easier to see in the picture, aggravated is really hard to see it, uh, visually, so it's, it's much smaller, but, um, um, and not statistically significant, but you know, we do find on average a slight decline in aggravated, not statistically significant, but um, mainly coming from simple. Um, so, so, so I think so. What we have as kind of a kind of how do we make sense of this? What we say, you know, what we find is that it, it's it's not clearly lining up with a story of um, of of just this coming from the less you know serious, and that that's where the the conflict is. That we get more calls of one type and fewer crimes of another type. That's not how it's lining up. It seems like both the calls and the crimes are you know uh, going in opposite directions, conditional and severity. Um, it also doesn't match a story if you think the costs of reporting would go up and victims are more likely to report more severe crimes, you would have expected that the crimes that we would see, we would see fewer of the less serious and more of the more serious. Um, if the threshold just goes up, then the mean conditional on, you know, exceeding that threshold should be higher. We don't see that either. So it's not a simple story of just more people are calling or fewer people are calling, um, but it does seem um, a little bit... Um, a little bit more more subtle than that. Um, when we look at, um, sorry, so this is just assault versus non-assault. Um, oh, oh, right, okay, sorry. So, um, so I was gonna just mention something we haven't done, but that we've kind of have on our next step list. Um, one possibility is that some of the more serious crimes wouldn't have been reported by witnesses necessarily or by victims, um, but that would be reported by healthcare providers. Um, COVID also reduced the likelihood of people going to the hospital for sort of non-COVID illnesses. Um, some hospitals shut down, emergency rooms were always operating, um, but that is one of the mechanisms that we were kind of imagining where you have on the one hand, neighbors are reporting um, fights that aren't necessarily physically violent, um, but that the physical, you know, incidents of physical violence are, that, that are leading to injury are not being reported because people are, you know, basically suffering through um, things that they otherwise would have gone to a doctor for. Um, but that is speculative, not, not in our data, just consistent with what we're seeing. Um, the other thing that we did was sort of looking at the context of what was going on with crime in LA overall. So is it that this is the pattern we see for other kinds of crimes other than DV? Now it's hard to think of like a clean benchmark comparison for DV because the crimes that people report to police, you know, property crimes are very different. So what we do is we just focus on assaults and we compare um, DV assaults to non-DV assaults. Um, 
And so what we see here is that um, the DV assaults went down. This is the picture you saw before. So during the shutdown, DV assaults go down. After the reopening, DV assaults continue to go down. Um, what you can see is that assaults for non-DV crimes went down much, much more during the shutdown. Um, and that makes perfect sense uh, when you think about the location of where the crimes are taking place. So non-DV assaults typically take place outside the home. If people are not leaving their home, we would expect those crimes to go way down. They do. And then what happens with reopening is that they go back up to where they were before. What's different is that, so it's a bigger drop for the non-DV than for DV during the shutdown. And in the reopening, DV stays low and non-DV goes back up. So if we look at it as a share of assaults, during the shutdown, DV had a pretty significant three percentage point increase in the share of um, all assaults that everything that the LAPD handles, 3% more of their caseload was coming from DV compared to non-DV during the shutdown. Um, so even though DV is going down, it's sort of going up as a fraction of the crimes. Um, but then after the reopening, that reverses. The other crimes go back up and um, DV stays, uh, DV continues to decrease. Um, so that's uh, that's that. Okay, let me. Uh, uh, I think I still have yeah, I still have a few minutes, so I can show you a little bit about mechanism. Um, so the other thing that we we tried to do, I think that sort of from an econometric point of view, this is kind of <laughs> fraught. We have we had a one shock, a um, bunch of things happen at once, so it's hard to try to disentangle. Um, and so um, so we try a little bit. I think we kind of think of two different types of ways that we can we can disentangle. Um, we have so we have this the pandemic risk, we have the shutdowns, and we have um, economic shocks, and so. Um, and so what we do is we kind of think of two different kinds of kinds of covariates we can stick into the model to try to um, try to absorb these other effects. Um, there's some things that changed before 2020 also. And so those I think we can estimate a little bit better, right? We have some identification. Uh, if we wanted to measure the effect of a school closure on domestic violence, what we can do is we can use that variation in school closures in the pre-pandemic period, right? Schools are closed um, for vacations and holidays and snow days, and we can get all that data from the earlier two years. Um, and we can see whether that is predictive and then see, you know, controlling for what we would have expected from a school closure in general, what's left over from the pandemic, um, which included a school closure, right? So what's what else is left? So we can do that. We can do that with variation in unemployment rates as well. And we do those two things. Um, and so so there we can get some information about, you know, what are the what are the the effects of those? Now we have a bit of a challenge for some of these things that really kind of only start in 2020. Um, and so what we do is we, we basically um, just put in controls for them, kind of absorbing part of the effects. Um, and so that's the, the there was a mobi mobility drop. So in the US, you know, um, the LA, California is one of the earliest shutdowns. It's in late March, but it's still um, a week and a half, couple of weeks after the WHO formally declares a pandemic. And after there was a decline in, you know, cell phone activity, when did people stop leaving their houses? Um, so we can, we put in a control for that and we see what's left, you know, after you control for the initial drop in mobility, what's incremental for the shutdown. We can also control for like disease risk by, by using cases and deaths associated with uh, COVID, with the pandemic itself. And then we took advantage of this new um, data set that was co compiled for the U.S. Um, so it's a uh, uh, a team that had originally looked at political violence and protests internationally, but it started the US project in 2020 um, and take account of sort of the Black Lives Matter protests and also right wing protests, um, you know, against uh, COVID restrictions and masks. All of those are in the data. And so we sort of put them all together, the protests and riots and control for that. Um, OK, so this is a table that kind of summarizes um, the, the outcome of those regressions, um, where each column is a, um, a different outcome variable of, for our four main outcomes. The first three are the police data, dispatches, um, it's the 911 calls, crimes, um, and arrests. And then the fourth one is the calls to the hotline. Um, the first two rows are the coefficients that we've been looking at all along, the effect of the initial shutdown compared to the pre-shutdown period, and then the post initial shutdown, which is relative to the shutdown itself. Um, and what you can see is this is sort of what's left after we added these extra covariates to the model. Um, so, so these coefficients do change. I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, and then these are the coefficients for these um, five additional variables that I just described. And so what we find here is kind of interesting. We do find a significant positive relationship between school closure and all of our measures of DV. Um, so, um, and so that could be increased reporting, people are home more, either there's more incidents or there's more reporting um, when kids are home. Um, and so we see, 
and this is controlling for day of the week effects also. So this is um, so this is significantly um, increasing. What that means then is that controlling for school closures makes the effects um, on calls get smaller. So some of that increase in calls is explained by a school closure, but for crimes, it's the opposite, right? So our coefficient of the unexplained drop in crimes actually is bigger than the, than, than the total drop in crimes. Um, and that's true because the school closure goes in the opposite direction. It's a pretty big effect. Um, we don't find significant unemployment effects except for the hotlines where a greater unemployment is associated with more calls. Um, when we split it by male, female, it also doesn't make a difference um, in terms of uh, shifting these estimates. The mobility drop, we do find that crime started to go down before the shutdown, um, but still there's a still very large incremental decrease um, following the official shutdown. Um, for cases, we find that additional cases are associated with more dispatches and crimes and fewer arrests, which is consistent with, you know, stress from the cases leading to more GV, but then um, more cases actually affecting police responses. So police maybe are hesitant to arrest people um, when there's more disease risk, either because they're worried about their own safety um, or because they um, are concerned about the safety of the, of the offenders. Um, for political protests, we do find um, that we don't find an effect on dispatches or arrests. Um, we find an increase, it's associated with an increase in crime. So again, that's going in the opposite direction of our effects. Um, there's more protests in the summer. Um, so that should have, that would normally suggest that we should have more DV crimes, um, but it's fewer. And then um, for hotline calls, it does seem to be associated with a decrease. Okay, so you know, in the end, we find a few consistent effects um, and then other things that don't seem to be consistent across um, across the across the different measures. Um, but overall, we when we put these things in, we still find significant um, and pretty um, stable um, estimates for the effects of the shutdown and and reopening. Um, and for crimes, those coefficients, like I said, get even bigger. Um, and so to conclude, we find that DV um, in LA does seem to have been affected by the pandemic. I mean, we think that these things are, um, you know, even though they're going in opposite directions, I think that, that we do think that, they're, that they are being affected in significant ways, um, but that it seems that the different measures are finding um, different, um, different effects, particularly for the initial uh, shutdown. The reopening um, does consistently lead to a decline across all the measures. Um, and so we kind of note, end with a note of caution, at least kind of from our own experience and from our reading of this like initial literature, especially um, with US data, is that it's um, very um, difficult to, um, to use these real-time data without paying, you know, it's, it's hard to interpret things without paying a lot of attention to these issues of data quality and measurements that at least for people like me who often like to use, you know, official survey sources that are nice and clean and, and well taken care of, you know, it's, it's really a different world. Um, and, and that's sort of not something you can just pool together a bunch of, um, a bunch of data and, and kind of hope for the best. Um, and we think that even with comparable data, we might expect to see heterogeneous effects um, with um, across cities. Um, and so our kind of hope with these other cities is that maybe um, maybe when we if we can account for this heterogeneity using these common mechanisms, um, but but if not, um, we may just be stuck in a world of saying this was the effect in this place and in this place and not really um, having a you know a nice um, a nice theory that, that brings it together. Um, so, so unfortunately that's where we are now, but that's sort of why I'm interested of course in hearing about, um, about insights and, and thoughts that you guys have. So I think um, this, this is, I'll put up the thank you slide and then um, I can take off the slides and pull them up if needed. Thanks so much, Amanda. The floor is open for questions, uh, comments and all other kinds of discussion. Um, I have one comment. Uh... Actually, well, uh, thanks for the and Anna has a, well. a question as well, but Bernardo, please go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, so yeah, uh, mm -hmm. it's quite interesting uh, what you said at the end because I remember, I'm not sure if like in this seminar or in the internal seminar we saw some time ago, like uh, another presentation on, on domestic violence. I believe it was in some Latin American country, but I might be wrong. And while they focus more on like uh, the effect of the school closures on reporting, and they see that actually like once uh, schools close, the, the reporting of the domestic violence drops. And it seems that in that particular context, it seemed that, that some of the reporting was done like by the teachers or by the people working at the school. So like, uh, which go in the opposite direction of, 
of what you find in this paper. So I just wanted to, to bring up yeah. this comment. Uh, that's a great point. Um, I, I can comment on that a little bit more because um, I kind of say domestic violence and what I have, what we have in mind is mainly intimate partner violence. Um, so with adults, um, you know, either, um, uh, you know, people who are married or uh, partners um, or former partners. Um, but, but in fact, the domestic violence coding from the police often does include um, uh, sort of violence within a household that could involve child abuse or children. Um, I think that there is a literature in the US um, and I think um, possibly in Latin America as well, where um, child abuse is definitely more likely to be reported um, when schools are open. Um, and part of that is because teachers are man mandatory or mandated reporters. So if they see something by law, they're supposed to report. Um, I think at least my reading of the literature and my understanding in the US is that that mechanism doesn't work for violence in terms of if a child's parents uh, parents are in an abusive relationship and the kid is themselves. If a kid shows up in school with bruises or something, then that's the kind of thing a teacher would notice. If a kid is crying, it may not lead to a situation of investigation of the adults. But violence against the children, I agree, definitely. Um, uh, there is evidence that, it, that that it's or not just violence, but neglect and other kinds of issues um, are more likely to be reported or less likely to be reported when school is out of session. Um, yeah, and so that was kind of our concern. Our thinking with the sort of adult side of it was that the hospitals are the one area where we have mandated reporters. If a nurse or if a doctor sees a kind set of injuries that are kind of forensically linked, you know, this is mostly, you know, the woman might say, oh, it's an accident, I fell down the stairs, but you wouldn't have had that type of injury, um, then they're supposed to call the police. And that is the law, I think, across the US and in California, it certainly is. Um, and so if people are not showing up at the hospital, it's sort of analogous, like the kid's not going to school, um, but we haven't been able to see it. Okay. Sorry, Anna, you're waiting so patiently with your yellow hands up on your... <laughs> yes. Okay, so I have several questions. First of all, what happens uh, during and after? <clears throat> what are the instructions? Should po uh, police uh, um, react immediately or not? And also, uh, did uh, the duration of call change? Maybe victim don't uh, the, uh, uh, don't have enough time to tell something. So, yes. Yeah, sorry, I, I missed the first part of your question. You said uh, the, what, uh, um, what during uh, the, call? the instruction? What, uh, what okay. happened during the call and after after a call? Uh, okay, so um, so for the calls, I don't have inf we don't have data on the call duration. Although I can check. Um, so the calls. Okay, so the hotline calls. Um, we don't know what happens in the call. The hotline that we have is kind of. Um, it's it's the sort of it's the call it's a number you call but it's basically just directs you to your local agency so basically it serves it's for the whole county there's 10 million people they call that number and then when you call they say what's your zip code you put in your zip code and then it directs you to the local um, support service so 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 they gave us their information um, but you know it's it, that's not informative um, what uh, the police I, I can check I think they just have the time of the call I don't think we see the start and end time of the call. Um, so I don't know, um, yeah, if they're getting less information in a call. So what you might have expected maybe is that what we have coded as dispute, or maybe they didn't even know it was DV, right? So if you didn't get enough, I mean, sort of, it could be, yeah. It, I, so, so some of that could lead to, um, people calling. So that you would think would lead to sort of less reporting. Um, if that's what's going on, and, and that could be um, that that's what's going on, or that the call got recorded, but it didn't have as much information, so then it wasn't treated as seriously, and so then that leads to this other stuff where either the police don't come, and or they come, and, you know, they're not really following up and with the same information, so that um, that is possible. Um, what the police told us, um, they said, it's a little funny, so we asked them, like, did you do anything differently because of COVID, um, and, you know, I you have to take it with a grain of salt because they're not going to, I mean, I, you know, no one's going to say that we're not taking it seriously. So they said that they didn't really change their procedures. Um, LA has a pretty nice system for DV where the police um, work together with local um, agencies. So local um, 
uh, support organizations that they have these things called DART teams. And so when they have a domestic call, the police go on their own first and kind of make sure everything's safe. So if there's like a weapon, you know, they get the weapon, they kind of stop whatever's happening immediately. And then after that, um, before they do kind of like, uh, um, before they would arrest someone or kind of leave the scene, they call this backup team of basically lawyers and social workers and say, and usually what they do is they come, they would send someone and that person would talk to the victim, talk to, you know, talk to the kids, kind of make sort of take care of the social side of it. Um, they said that that was still happening, uh, but they did, and they did say that during some of the lockdown that the team, some of those organizations were either not operating or operating remotely. So they didn't actually send a person, but basically the officer would like call on his cell phone or her cell phone. And then like the victim would have to talk on their cell phone. So that's, you know, um, it's possible that, 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 that was part of, you know, that, that, that information you need to be able to say a crime happens. So often it relies on, on the witness or the victim testimony. And if they're going to say nothing happens, and there isn't like that dark team or that extra social support to like make the woman feel safe. You know, it is possible that that, that there was, um, that, that that could affect, um, you know, that, that, that could affect the crime kind of conditional on a call and conditional, the, the crime reporting conditional on everything. And um, yeah, so it is possible, even if the sort of police are as well-intentioned as they, you know, that they're not trying to, 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 you know, they're trying to take it seriously. Um, so I'll tell you one thing it's not, I think we just make a footnote that's a little bit um, complaining about this. Um, one thing it's frustrating for us is that they do have the LAPD and a lot of departments um, have these things that they file because DV is such a, um, a sensitive topic. They, they actually file these reports called domestic incident reports. Um, they're supposed to file them for every domestic incident that isn't a crime. So if it's a crime, there's a crime report, but if it's not a crime, they're supposed to keep track of fighting or threats or things that like, you know, they don't actually lead to an arrest, but that are something. And they told us that they keep track of those and those are actually really important evidence later. So it could be that someone calls and there's a DIR report. They call again, again, it's not a crime, but there's a DIR report. Then they call again, as they're trying to get a restraining order, those DIR reports are part of the history. The prosecutor uses them in court. So they are meaningful, even if they're not crimes. And so what we would love to see is, you know, are there DIR reports? Because um, I think that these cases where like the victim is not sure about testifying or not sure about pressing charges, you know, but there's something going on that's not right and they want to make a record of it, we would see that. Um, we've asked for them and we were, <laughs> we were denied. Um, so we're going to keep trying, but um, that would be, I think, useful to see um to, to see sort of what's going on with all of these calls right calls are going up and crimes are not saying the same they're going down like what is happening with all of these non-criminal calls um is it really that people are wrong or is it you know something um some, something else uh sorry it's a long answer um i hope it no, addresses thanks. your question that was, but... that was quite quite informative please any further questions or comments about Amanda? Um, I have uh, another question also. So uh, during the presentation, you mentioned that uh, uh, like the political protests that happened during 2020 could maybe have some impact on the results. And my related question is like, well, not being a daily follower of US news is that, are you aware of any such, any similar situations that could have happened in the previous years that could have some alter the results or 2018 and 19, let's say were normal years? Uh. Yeah, so I think nationally, my sense is that there isn't, that 2018 and 2019 are normal. When you get to a local level, then I think that city wise, you know, there are, it's, you know, we've, we've, we've sort of looked at some other cities and sometimes 2018 and 2019 look different from each other. And they look different from 2020 even before. COVID. So, uh, you know, I think there is sort of natural fluctuation or, you know, there are, there are, there are, there are differences um, that, that at least from the, from our point of view are unexplained and probably driven by something um, that is happening. Um, you know, there's some studies of COVID and DV that have put in weather, um, you know, 2020 was a little, in the U.S. was a little bit warmer than usual in the spring. Um, you know, that sort of I don't think would explain what we're finding, but um, 
Um, the political protests, I think, you know, they're not new in the sense that there were protests before. So if we had data on that, that would be useful, but they're much um, larger and, and wider. Um, and the sort of context of what we're looking at, you know, we're looking at DV in particular, but there is this kind of debate going on about policing and about crime and assaults in general in the US and sort of some of this debate um, is related to these Black Lives Matter protests um, that are about policing in particular, but then also this kind of response, um, you know, um, by um, by advocates of policing of saying that, you know, that, that police will react to this by under policing or de-policing. Um, and so the idea is, is that if police don't want to be criticized for, you know, intervening in certain neighborhoods or with certain communities, maybe they just don't police and that that would lead to, or le they don't police as intensively and that could lead, that could actually hurt victims and lead to more crime. Um, and so to the extent that, you know, I don't know that there's empirical proof one way or the other about whether de-policing is an actual phenomenon and, you know, um, caused by the um, protests. Um, we do find kind of something consistent with it in the fact that arrests do seem to go down for DV, um, during, you know, in following protests. And so that is, you know, consistent with that story. I don't want to be like an endorser of that story. I don't know that it's rigorously, um, you know, true, um, but, but, uh, but there was at least a lot of kind of discussion and sort of police chiefs and police advocates kind of saying, oh, crime has gone up. And if you've kind of looked at this sort of news reports, you're not following US news closely, but, um, you know, saying that crime actually in 2020, um, at least murders or homicides did go up. Um, and so it's sort of um, that some cities and it's not publicly available data. And I, you know, I think they have, you know, an agenda to say that that, that murders went up um, because of protests against them. Um, and so I'd want to see it with like, you know, um, a little bit with the reliable data and the death data will come out eventually. It's usually a couple of year delay. Um, so eventually, you know, there will be rigorous social science um, and economic uh, studies on this. Um, and I think that that will be really useful. Um, and we'll kind of see what what was just one city or just a couple cities and or kind of very bad messy data versus what's what's really going on. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Anyone further, please. Um, Amanda, uh, going back to your discussion of mechanisms, uh, I can think of two major uh, mechanisms underlying this spike in violence. The first one, to put it bluntly, is that people just see too much of each other. <laughs> they can find in small areas and that's a little bit too much. And that leads to violence, to aggression, so on and so forth. And the second one is that uh, uh, this violence is a release of uh, frustration, uh, sense of helplessness, crisis, disappointment. <clears throat> and uh, these two occurred simultaneously because COVID caused both of course, a lot of economic hardship, a lot of fears and everything else. And at the same time, people are confined to small quarters <clears throat> with their quote unquote loved ones. <clears throat> and these loved ones become a little bit less loved. Uh, so uh, any idea as to how these two interact with each other? There was one indication in your presentation. You said that unemployment did not have a big impact. On, uh, on this violence. So that suggests that this confinement effect is probably stronger than uh, the crisis and hardship effect. But I would like to ask you to please talk a little bit more about this. Sure. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, there is a, a literature um, kind of pre-pandemic that does look at economic, tries to look at economic hardship. Um, and so I think the fact that we don't find it in our you know, our regression, the unemployment was not a significant predictor. Um, I think some of that could be because of the CARES Act and because of what happened um, in the U.S. that actually, you know, unemployment was not as bad of an economic shock in, in the U.S. after the pandemic as it had been in the past. So we have kind of variation in unemployment in our sample in 2018, 2019, there's less variation. Unemployment is worse for you, but it doesn't vary as much. Um, and so in 2020, we have a huge increase in unemployment, um, but a lot of people who are unemployed are getting, um, um, are getting supplemental uh, payments. And so it could be that the economic impact wasn't, at least immediately wasn't as bad. It was mitigated. Um, 
it was mitigated. So we tried to look at that. I think with just one city, it's just like, we just don't have enough variation um, to sort of compare. But I, so that's something that we've kind of been looking at. I think it, it could be that there was sort of more fear and uncertainty, <laughs> but, but, but less of an immediate effect. You know, people got stimulus payments, people got extra unemployment. Some unemployed people received more payments than they had been getting when they were working. So these are sort of people who were lower income um, because there was this um, $600 a week supplement that didn't depend on how much you were earning before. Um, so for some people, so, so, so I think that the economic impact wasn't as bad. The other thought we had, and we haven't done, um, you know, so the other thought about kind of the, the, the stress, I mean, I think that, I don't know that this separates the two stories, but there is this question about looking at the timing of you know some of the the you know some of I think that there's some question where like the stress and the confinement some of that you wouldn't expect that to all explode on the first day that you're locked in I mean maybe it would maybe there's like the shock in that initial day but some of the stuff would build up over time and so um, you know maybe the fact that some of the increase in calls is not happening on the first day it's sort of slowly increasing and then it kind of decreases suggests that it's maybe people are you know that there that is this escalation. Um, that 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 need that that is going on over time. Um, we haven't, um, yeah. So we we just looked at that in the figures, and it does it does kind of look that way. Um, um, and then we have it on our list to kind of see maybe the school closures, like having your kids at home. It, you know, it adds to that confinement, right? If you have more people in the same space, um, but you know, if it's having your kids at home for a weekend or for a short amount of time, you know, when you can leave the house, that's different from having them for months on end, um, you know, in the same room as you. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think that, you know, uh, kind of theoretically, I think all these things are, are possibly going on. I think empirically, it's just challenging to, to try to pin them down um, conclusively. Okay, well, um, uh, thanks. And then my second question is, uh, uh, you have a very limited set of covariates of controls, which I think is a flip side of your data. It's not a survey set of data. So, and police probably would not disclose much of individual details for privacy reasons. But uh, is there any chance to infer some individual characteristics of people based on zip code? Because <laughs> uh, race can be uh, correlated with zip code. And I saw an interesting study that uh, even political preferences sometimes are clearly correlated with zip codes in big US metropolitan cities. Uh, so you can say something about the people that live in a particular area that perhaps could be used to shed some extra light on this one. Did you ever try that? Yeah, I, I think that's a great, um, a great, a great point. And I think so with, uh, with LA right now, we actually have pretty good information about um, about the, um, I'm just trying to remember which one. I think we have it very good for the crimes, but not very good for the calls. So for the crimes, we know the hundred block area, basically like the the city block where where it's taking okay. place. Right. Um, so that's you know, um, that's that's pretty good for the for the calls. I think we just know like the 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 dispatch center. So we so we have um, it's a much bigger geography. Uh, we've asked for more detailed data. We were turned down for that. Um, so we might be able to just do it for one part. Uh, for other cities that we do have better geographic information on both. And so I think that we might um, try to try to do that in other cities. Uh, one thing we started to do was to split it up by areas that had more Hispanic um, population or Latino population. Uh, part of that is kind of LA specific, but also I think a common thing in the US, there's an, um, kind of interesting issues about um, um, about um, people who are um, undocumented. Um, so they're, you know, living in the US, um, but um, they don't have, you know, official um, legal presence, right, um, under immigration law. Um, and so on the one hand, there's sort of an extra concern in general about um, being, um, um, when you're in an undocumented household, either if the person is undocumented or other people in the household are undocumented, there's a concern about calling the police because that could lead to, you know, deportation or, right. um, or other issues. And LA has a pretty big undocumented population. Um, so I think that there's sort of, you know, um, and so it's not clear what, you know, it's not obvious how that would play out with the pandemic, but it could be that it makes it even worse if you're worried about deport being deported and then not able to come back to the US or, 
Um, you know, it, so 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 we have. I think we had done a rough cut, and we didn't really see much difference. Um, but I think we haven't done it in a very careful way. So that was kind of one of our thoughts. And we could also do stuff by. Um, um, yeah, there may also be um, racial variation um, by 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 area. So we we haven't really done much for the for the demographics. Um, I think I bet that's sort of on our list, and I will remind my co-authors it should stay on the list. Thanks very much, Bernardo. You had another question. Uh, no, uh, that that was said before. Uh, oh, so asked, you, uh, you, you I think asked a question. Uh, right? Timur had a question, I believe. Oh, Timur, of course. Timur, please. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I had a very short question about the uh, your data trends. So the, it seemed to me that there was a, a seasonality in several of the uh, indicators, like crime and so on. So once you, so my question is, once have you tried to detrend de 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 the uh, the 2012 uh, data, uh, 2020 data, because uh, it could look even. Uh, your results could be even more stronger if you get rid of this seasonality. I think, yeah, at, at least it seems to me from the visual, uh, from the present visual presentation of the data. Uh, yeah, so we didn't detrend it. You're saying that it would, it, um, we we just kind of compared it to the same time period, but you're thinking of more of like a, a particular um, process, like taking out some kind of a, a, some 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 frequency. Is that yes, because if you look at 2019 and 18, it seems like there's a seasonality in those data. They, they look pretty much the same. And but to 2020, of course, is very different. Yeah, so we do account for yeah, so we we do we account for like the comparison. Um, I think we just in this mod and the, the results I showed you did a very rough thing. We just control for um, I think the month and the day of the week. So there's like, there's there's a few cycles, right? There's there's the weekly uh, variation. And then there's also, I think the, the broader variation. Um, what we could do, what we've also done, but isn't in the paper is putting in like controls for the week of the year. So that would be some variation within the month. Um, and then weather to the extent that that's uh, a driver, an underlying driver of it. Um, I wasn't sure if you were thinking about like some kind of a more like time series sort of agnostic um, approach to like some 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 underlying seasonality from that, but because uh, we have not done that, even though I think our data one city seven hundred days is kind of uh, borderlining on a time series. Um, but as as <laughs> as micro people, we don't want to we don't want to acknowledge that, so we're going to just call it a panel and be happy with that. Um, okay, thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, let's see if there are any other questions or comments. If not, then I think we can leave it at this. And uh, all that remains to be done is to thank Amanda very much for her thought-provoking presentation and uh, to express our hope that perhaps at better times you'll be able to come to Moscow in person. And we'll continue this discussion. Amanda, thanks so much. And thanks so much to everyone. Uh, Bernarda, could you please convention remind us what, what do we have next week? Uh, yes, well, uh, thanks, um, uh, Amalia, for uh, presenting with us. It was a pleasure to have you here and hope to meet you offline at some point uh, sooner rather than later. And, uh, well, uh, we will have a two weeks break in our research seminars, uh, just not to go on parallel with the April HEC conference. And the next presentation will be on the 29th of April. And Christina Hutunen from the Alto University is going to present her paper in sickness and in health, job displacements and health spillovers in couples. So that's going to be 29th of April. So for two weeks, uh, we will not see each other, but we welcome you uh, at uh, the end of the month, same place and same time. So thanks everyone for joining and have a good rest of the week. Very good. Thanks very much. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thanks, Aman. Bye-bye.